hard part is for some people is allowing themselves to be that simple and that, and overcomplicate it. Not more is better, but um, to overthink it, to go back to it after another day and another day and refine, 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 refine. refine. It's like sometimes you're just done. Like you have it, and it might take five minutes or it might take three weeks. It's not every project is the same. Sometimes you get it right away, and like you just that's something you've learned too. Is just just stop when you know you have it. <laughs> it's it's okay. It's done. Don't overwork it. Hey everybody, welcome to Works in Process. This podcast is a series of conversations where I speak to designers, artists, writers, and more to discuss their creative methodologies. I'm your host, designer and educator, George Garastegui. In this episode, I talk to graphic designer Michael Braley from his home office in Lexington, Kentucky. He has over 25 years of experience in branding, visual systems, and most notably poster design. Today we discuss the power of research, discovery, and sometimes just knowing when the right time is to finish that project. So now let's get into our conversation. Hey Michael, thank you for taking the time to chat with me today from Lexington, Kentucky, and welcome to the Works and Process podcast. Thanks, George. So I've kind of started doing this little thing where I ask my podcast guests this fun set of questions to kind of get us loose. Right. I call these icebreakers and it's first going to be this or that questions. And then it's going to be a bunch of word associations. Okay. Okay. Ready. So this is just kind of this or that toaster or bagel. Bagel. Um, but it has to be from the corner of deli on Brooklyn where we used to live. Specifically only uh, yes. one bagel. Okay. Yes. Um, rock or hip hop. Um, rock. Beatles or the Rolling Stones. Beatles. Chicago or New York style pizza? Ooh, uh, New York. Helvetica new or accidents grotesque? That's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> it's not fair. Sophie's choice. Um, accidents. I knew it. <laughs> Books or movies? Books. And I find movies. I, 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 it might sound strange, but I just cannot suspend my disbelief when watching movies. I can only really watch documentaries. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Now we're just going to the word association. So really just the first thing that comes to your mind. Okay. All right. Creativity. Endless. Design. Um, process. Art. Mystery. Business. Uh, also mystery. Sometimes. <laughs> Failure. Disappointing. Clients. Uh, part of the job. Mistakes. Uh, again, also part of the job. Tools. Crutches. Skills. Napoleon Dynamite. <laughs> You're the second person who said that. <laughs> Opportunity. Uh, take it. Future. Unknown. Risk. Evaluation. And last, process. Process. Um, enjoyable. I mean, I, I love what I do, and I, and I mainly love the process of doing it. Cool. And not not necessarily even the, what the finished piece looks like. I think it's more fun to actually do the work than it is to like review it afterwards. So cool. That was, that was painless, you know, um, <laughs> mostly, <laughs> mostly painless. So we've known each other for a while. I think we've known each other probably, I don't know, over 10 years, maybe. Yeah. Right. Cause I worked with Kate and then we met. So I know you, I look at your website, I see what you can do, but maybe there's some people who are listening to this, who you know, are listening to you for the first time, meeting you for the first time. And can you give us what we, what I'm calling our origin story of Michael Braley? Schooling, design, a little bit of, you know, where you've been, what you've been up to. Sure. Uh, well, I was 
the I'm the son of a graphic designer. My father's a graphic designer, and my mother's a music teacher. So I'm, I'm both of those people definitely influenced where I am now, uh, either directly or indirectly. So my dad actually is is in uh, Indianapolis, and my mom's in Iowa, where I grew up in Iowa, and Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Uh, he uh, actually designed the bear paint logo back in 1975 so around the house at the time really? when i was young yeah i i thought i had told you this before no uh, um and uh, so around the house he worked um for companies but also had um freelance business as well uh there would be paper samples markers uh tracing paper it's funny because the paper samples around the house were on these big, giant 12 by 18 reams of paper that were uh, held together by a plastic, big plastic wire binders. So on the corners, uh, I'd get to sketch on those or draw on those. I usually draw jet fighter airplanes, but I was more interested in drawing the graphics on the plane than than the actual plane. The planes are kind of kind of weak, I must say, uh, but the graphics were sweet. Um, and so in the corners of those pieces of paper, it would say, you know, like 80 or Mohawk, 80 pound text, ocean blue and, you know, small six point type. So it's fun to look back and say, oh my gosh, I didn't even know I was using a paper sample. I just thought that was the paper around the house. So I'll just use that. So I'd always had the access to the, I guess the tools of the trade at the time, you know, this is back in 1975 through 19. 19- 80 basically then also at the same a little bit later uh, i don't know junior high or maybe even early high school um the guy called big baseball fan big los angeles dodgers fan um and collected baseball cards for years probably have still have i don't know fifteen thousand cards but uh, also was attracted to not just the players my favorite players and you know my really good cards, but also the graphics. So each year when the sets came out, Topps, Don Russ, Fleer, sort of evaluate which of those three main brands at the time you know, had the best looking cards, not necessarily the best shot of the player. You were doing so that I in brought, high school? This is probably junior, probably sixth, seventh, eighth, eighth, ninth, I don't know, grade. And so looking at those just for their layout, but I still don't know if I knew what it what I was doing, but I would draw those cards on an eight eight by ten notebook. So you know, have the card and then just look at it and draw the um, the the players. And then, but I really focus on um, the graphics of the card out outside of the players. Um, and probably I don't know. 30 of those it's the same thing with the model airplanes i would try to pick some of the poses for the players that weren't too hard for me to draw at the time and not draw any faces because that was i wasn't interested and i couldn't really draw those uh, very well uh, so the players look kind of kind of goofy but the out the the graphics of the cards um pretty were a lot better i would say you know, I would still use the, the markers and um, I'd draw it in pencil first and go around it with a pen and then go in to fill in the colorways with the with the markers. But yeah, that was really fun. I mean, I, I, I was planning to post some of those sometime, but I just I'm a little nervous. <laughs> you know, it's like you show the actual shot of the real card and then the drawing of the card. You still have those? So, yeah, I have. Yeah. I have them. I'm gonna I'm gonna show them for the first time in a lecture next month. Um, so that's sort of you know, the art background. I didn't really. I took maybe one drawing class or two drawing classes in junior high, but other than that, I did stuff on my own at home. Uh, but and uh, so I also played piano for eight years and string bass for two or three, and percussion and you know, so there's that love of the arts is in theater groups in high school. So it just uh, felt more, more comfortable in those environments than in a math class for sure. <laughs> um, so yes, I, I knew that I wanted to be a 
graphic designer probably in, uh, I don't know, ninth or 10th, 10th grade. Uh, and then, uh, looked at graphic design schools and in, in Iowa, Iowa state had a fantastic program visited there and just knew that that's where I wanted to go. They have a fantastic foundation program, meaning that, um, you know, you start with color and typography and form really basic, um, in a, um, Swiss oriented type of style. Now that's changed somewhat since, you know, 25 years ago, but I'm happy that I went there because also at the time we're still doing things by hand with waxing typed down on a piece of paper, you know, measuring the lettering or the letting and kerning by hand using a Haber rule to set the type. You know, we, people can look up Haber rule. Oh my God. Um, you know, drawing letters by hand, you know, enlarging it to, you know, six inches tall to really get into the fine point or finer points of typography that I think is somewhat lost today when you just go on the computer and just set your type. That's kind of a different podcast. It's a whole other conversation. <laughs> but but the, what I was saying about the interesting time was so there's that going on. And there's also the current work by uh, at the time when he's, you know, Charles Anderson was becoming more and more popular. Um, of course, I hate to say it, David Carson and um, Tibor Kallman with Colors Magazine was coming out at the same time. Um, also, Neville Brody. These are people that weren't necessarily talked about in class, but we'd see them in other annuals and design annuals and um, it was really progressive work that was pushing the boundaries of typography and also just design in general. Um, that was influenced me, but also there's another side that I was really attracted to, which was uh, really clean logos, marks, and typography. So um, people like Shermanoff and Geismar, you know, the design legends of today, um, Paul Rand, uh, Lester Beale, you just, these people that you did learn about in design history or saw books or did your own research. I did a lot of my own research on um, designers just because I was interested and still am fascinated with design history, uh, especially some of the designers from the 1930s, 40s, and Dutch design such as Piet Zwart and Paul Schutema, uh Dick Elfers, uh, just the list goes on and on. Uh, but what they were doing with typography at the time in the 30s was even more original and still is fresh today and different than what people were doing that we thought was original in 1990. You know, you go back to that stuff and like, wow, that looks just as fresh today as it does, did back then. And that's what I strive for in my work to make it... Um, to, to actually not have a style. And I know people have said this and you have too, like, well, there's definitely a style and it's not intentional to have a style. A student asked me at one of the workshops years ago, you know, well, what makes a great poster? And, and no one had really asked me that before. And I hadn't really thought of it. I just do what I think is right and what looks good, which is very hard to teach. I think uh, you, you just know it or you have it or you don't. Agreed. <laughs> you, you know, I'm sure you see the near students too. And it's sucky to say, but some people have it and some don't. <laughs> well, I mean, you know? I think a lot of people are exposed to things more often and you get to see it, you know, and you get to be, you get to be yeah. aware of, of that. This is a thing, right? So sometimes you're, you, you know, you grew up in a house with a designer and a musician, right? So you're exposed to things and you're yeah. able to, to make that connection that this, this idea or this feeling that you have actually is something right? Because you've been around it. True. But there's a whole other side of that and a whole other side of that, which is then not only going to the class and learning about the history and learning about what, you know, form is, what balance, light and dark, chiaroscuro, you know, all that, all those terms to do. I did a lot of my own research on other designers to dig even deeper to find out kind of what, is what looks good 
and then like how they did it. I mean, the bookshelf behind me is probably one of my prized possessions because that's where it comes from. You know, that's the inspiration. Um, I don't go back to them as much as I used to, but, um, it sort of reminds me of like that. So all the work I did also not just going to school, but really doing reading, looking at other people's work from different time periods. So back to the, back to the point about the person asked me, well, what makes a good poster? I just said, uh, I said clarity, simplicity, and impact. So it's like, it's like my own CSI. And so I've tried to put it into like a sentence. What would that be if I had to say, you know, other than just clarity, simplicity, and impact, what does that mean? So it would be that I employ design to deliver unmistakable clarity through simplicity of both form and message to achieve maximum impact. There you go. That's a statement right work, there. I'm still working on it. <laughs> but, and then um, but sort of a sub subsection of that would be that to me, the challenge of reducing and refining that concept to its most pure and simplistic form is most satisfying for me. That process like we talked about earlier is more exciting than actually being finished with it and looking at it and saying that's the right answer. Right. I mean, no. we're, you know, we're designers, right? And we're, when I don't think there's answers to what we do, right? There's, there's solutions, there's ways of approaching your solution today could be different than you do it next year for the same exact thing. That's true. Yeah. Right. So I, I don't think that they're, you know, that's why I, I, one of the things I teach is, you know, sometimes people are so used to right or wrong, yes or no answers. And I think design because of what we do is not really answer based. It, depending on who you need to do this for and, and what the outcome or the objective is, I think that is a solution, not an answer. Yes. The solution today might be the same solution as tomorrow. Um, did have quite a few experiences while I was working in San Francisco at Cahan and Associates. Did uh, a lot of annual reports and collateral material, brand identity. But for some of the annual reports, the basic story that the client wanted to tell was the same. So it was reinventing what you had done already for another client in a different visual and also message type of way. So it didn't look like you were doing basically telling the same story, um, which I also still think is, is fun and challenging. It's very, like how many times, how many times can you do this concept again and make it be different and not get bored with it? How many times did you do it? I don't know. It's a 10 times. I, in, that, I mean, in that thinking, right, where you have to do something and reinvent it again and again and again, but with different visuals. And how do you go about getting to a different visual solution, even though you're dealing with the same exact stuff? I, I don't know. Well, I mean, it's not like exactly the same message, but if you reduce it down to what is the real message, it's ba they're basically all trying to say the same thing. I don't actually know. I'm trying to think like, well, how did I do it? I don't know. It was just, it was the assignment. So right. I, I, I mean, I, if I, I can explain how. And I, and I, I mean, right. in the how, what does it mean? Like, oh, okay. I woke up at five o'clock and I did this one thing. I mean, I'm trying to figure out, cause I don't know that I have an answer how to do it different times. It's just not where we all came together. We just sort of did whatever we wanted to do. I mean, in my, my mind, I, I didn't want to do the same thing I did before. So just do something different, you know, and you had the, 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 opportunity to do that it's not like everything it was in a system and it had to be look like this from that certain studio uh, that was one of the great things about Cahan and associates with that there were um several designers each person would do their own idea present it to bill Cahan, the founder and owner and then he we would present those to the client and they'd get to pick which designer or which concept from the designer would um would uh, get the job so you're sort okay. of in a competition with, with your peers. And I do want to mention that during that time, I was there for about seven or eight years. It was an incredible, incredibly talented group of people that I, there weren't really titles. But uh, Bob Dennett, Sherry Brooks, and Kevin Roberson, I was always wanted to be as good as they were. So to be in the same space, working with them, seeing what they were up to, and uh, being around them was kind of very influential. 
And each of those people, and including myself now, have their own studios and have for 10, 15 years. And then, and then that are also working there afforded me to work, to start to get to work with top talent. You know, I think some of my success or a lot of my success coming comes from making connections with very talented people. And that's not just designers, it's photographers, it's writers, it's uh, illustrators, and, and printers. I mean, it all has to come together for me to be successful. Yeah, you're, you're, nobody's a, a one-man army. We need no. connections. Right. And speaking of one-man army, I mean, yes, I do work um, mainly by myself at our at home office, but I also have uh, my partner, Kate Davis, who uh, basically keeps the studio running, account management, um, some creative direction, uh, and she has an uh, extensive background in apparel design. She has a very good insight on... Dis, uh, design decisions as well. It's important. Um, so you worked in San Francisco. Yeah. Right. Then you came to New York and now mm-hmm. you're, you're residing in your home office in Kentucky. Yes. Right. Um, what are the differences in working in those three different locations? The differences I would say generally have to do with my overall, uh, relaxed state. <laughs> much more relaxed in Kentucky. Uh, and I think that also has to do with where, you know, a point in my career where I don't really think I would, it could work at a studio again. I'm, I'm just kind of finished with that part of what I've done. And I'm, I'm thankful that I did it. And again, met great people and still am in contact with a lot of those people that I've worked for. Uh, but yeah, I mean, that's kind of why you're, you're in your home studio. You can dictate yeah. who you want to work it, with and what projects you would like to do. Yeah. Yes. Somewhat. <laughs> I'd say that, you know, even though you know we're in Kentucky, doesn't mean that we have Kentucky clients. But most of our work, our mind work comes from uh, the coasts, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Portland, New York, uh, D.C., Couple, a couple in Chicago uh, over the past five years. That's the adv- that's the advantage of technology, I guess. If we go back way back earlier in our conversation, you know, yeah, I do use and dependent on it, but I don't use it as a design tool. I use it for a communication tool. You know, so most of the work is sent as a PDF, which I still despise. I find this presenting design on a screen to people looking through a PDF is less control. People have a hard time separating what it's going to look like, that trust of what it's going to look like when it's printed, and what they see on screen. Yeah. I mean, you have to get it ready for a client. So let me ask you, how do you build that trust over something digital when a lot of your stuff is a lot more tangible, where you need to see it in person, you need to kind of experience what it's going to look like? A PDF is different than a 30 by 40 poster, right? So if you're creating, or even a 50 by 60, or whatever the proportions are... It is well, one size. The, I, think, I don't think that the poster um, design is as much of an issue as, as the, like a book design or something that with multiple pages where the thing that I, uh, about pacing, pacing a book is really, really important. When you see, when you see design in, in design annuals, you might see one or two spreads from an editorial design or an report or a book design. And you're like, well, that looks really cool. But you know, then you get the book. If you if you buy the book and you look through it, there's so much more in, that goes into it. And the pacing, it, it, not just the visual pacing, but also the messaging pacing. Uh, I learned a lot about that when I was at K N Associates. How to how to basically not make a boring book, <laughs> right? <laughs> or to make it not look like every other book out there. So um, when you present that type of work. In a PDF, it's like pay, it's, you know, click, 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 and you can't flip through it to get the overall sense right away. It takes a long time to get through that. Back in the day, we used to actually build the 80 to 100 page comps and present the comp to the client in person so that they could actually see what it would look like, even though it was, you know, color copy output, but you know, build a real form of the thing at the right, at the exact size. Do you still do that? No. I wish I did. 
uh, I haven't really had any issues with presenting it as a PDF before. It's just it's just different, and it's it's my own thing. I just, I just don't like it. <laughs> No, it's, agreed. It's not accurate. It's just not accurate. Right. As designers, we look at things a certain way. We want it to be represented the way it's supposed to versus yeah. what the computer allows it to be represented as. Right. And this is, um, I've noticed lately that uh, a lot of the websites, booksellers especially, um, and some design websites, I'd like, I'm kind of working on how to best present this on my own site um, instead of having it be flat artwork and flat spreads. Um is just, you know, shooting it and having you flip through it and have it be a video or a GIF file. So that's one way that I guess I could get around it if I did that for a presentation. But so far, I really haven't needed it to do that. Okay. So I guess if you do feel the need, you may go through that process. Right. It would take like 10 seconds to do that and then you post it, right? Right. Flip through a book and you're done. So you talked about learning at the pacing of a book, which I think you know, designing a book is very different to designing a one-off poster or even a series of posters because it's, like you said, one page. It's not, um, it has to convey a lot of information, but the book has to create pacing and moments and when do you start, stop, and the feeling. How do you learn that? How do you learn the pacing of a book? What are some things that y you think are, are necessary to create that type of design? I, I think it's a balance of well, it definitely depends on the type of information that you need to convey in the book. Um, but I think it's a matter of the must-have content and a balance. It's sort of like a composing a piece of music, I would imagine. I mean, I've tried to compose some music, but never got anywhere. <laughs> but <laughs> you know, there's a balance of what needs to be in there, how you want it to overall, the overall general sense of the book, what it means, and visually mixed in with surprise or unexpectedness. Hmm. I guess it's sort of like a musical, like A, A, B, B, A, A, C, A, A, B, B, A, C. But then it might be A, A, B, B, C, Z. Like, whoa, I didn't know that was going to be in there the next time I turn the page. And it's you know, exciting, arresting, and it makes you stop instead of just flip all the way through the book. I like that. I like that element of surprise. I think that makes it interesting and, and a way for people to kind of not be monotonous. Yes. And it, and it doesn't work every time. You can't do that every time. But uh, to me, it's just how I think of it is more of a score than anything else, really. I like that, that analogy as a composing music. I think that's really, really interesting. So... Michael, when I look at your website and I look at some of the, the work that you have up there, one of the things that strike me is these poster design sections. And if you look at it and you see the, the varied um, designs and, and look, there's a lot of large type. There's a lot of nuance and dedication to making sure people understand the letter forms or what you're using. You're actually using letter forms as design. The letters themselves become pictures. There's no images in them. The images that are created are based on the type and in combining icons and in type together. But I look at your stuff and you definitely have what I would consider some type of a style. Do you consider yourself having a style? Um, I didn't for a long time consider myself having a style and didn't really like people saying, oh, you have a style and I get irritated. But over time, it's kind of like, you know what? Just own. I do. Yeah, I do. And here's my style. And this is what I think is right. And this is what I, I, I want to I want to do it this way because I like it. And other people do, too, apparently. You know, obviously, so, you don't like your you don't you didn't like I being had style having considered. A style. I, I didn't labeled as having a style because because overall i mean on the website you see what 15 projects or something maybe more but i've done you know god i don't even know how many projects 300 500 if you look at it that body of work i don't know that you could say that i have a style i tried to adapt whatever i could to the, make sure that the client got what they wanted and in a, but in a way that i got a little bit of what i wanted to to from, from that project um and sometimes that required to have you know more aggressive typography sometimes it more restrained uh, i do not only use helvetica 
or accidents or new house grotesque. I, I don't. It, people like to pigeonhole to say, oh, you, you only use Helvetica. That's a bunch of crap. If you go over the pa- past, you know, two years even recently, you know, I Champion, OCRA, Sabone, Trey Gothic, Franklin Gothic, Futura, Gotham. I made this list just for you, George. Did you? Yes. Like, no. You just, you just maybe some of the things you've seen recently or on the website just maybe looks like that. And it, however, if, if I want to use Helvetica, why can't I use Helvetica? Unless someone has in their brand guidelines, which, which has happened quite a bit, you know, that is their typeface, so you have to use it. I don't think there's a rule that says, well, Michael Bradley can't use Helvetica anymore. No, no, I, there is no rule. You know, just because you use classic typefaces such as Accidents and Helvetica, and they're really, really bold, they tend to stand out. So, of course, those are what people gravitate towards the most. As- right, and I, and I should say I use Sabone just as much. And it's funny, it's, it's Sabone, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but it was designed by uh, Jan Chickold. Oh, really? Yes, and you think of Jan Chickold, and you think of a very specific time of his career when he was doing the graphics that you all you go see in in uh, design history books. I mean, he was a, traditionally a book designer and typeface designer. Just a little fact. Little little tidbit. Yeah. It it really all goes back to my typography choices are based on you know the clarity, simplicity, and impact uh, statements that I made earlier, and I feel that a lot of the sans serif typefaces that I use. I used mainly to get an idea across without getting in the way of the message. And to that end, with the posters, uh, they're, they, a lot of them are in that aren't as necessarily typographic or more icon posters, so kind of almost like large logos or illustrations. Um, they have a very graphic, bold, and I would have to say sometimes you know clever solution to whatever the topic is of the poster. I I don't know. I just gravitate towards that type of design. And I enjoy the challenge of reducing it down to those simple elements so that you can't miss it. Like you like, you look at it and say, Oh, that makes perfect sense. Or, Oh, I get it. Now, some people, sometimes people don't get it, which is part of the failure. It's a disappointment. (laughs) But (laughs) I try to make it, as easy as possible for someone to immediately get the message. Which is probably some of the hardest stuff to do. I think the hard part is for some people is allowing themselves to be that simple and, and overcomplicate it. To, not more is better, but um, to overthink it, to go back to it after another day and another day and refine, 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 refine. It's like sometimes you're just done. Like you have it, and it might take five. It might take five minutes, or it might take three weeks. It's not every project is the same. Sometimes you get it right away, and like you just that's something you've learned too. Is just just stop when you know you have it. <laughs> it's it's okay. It's done. Don't overwork it. But I guess to to teach people, like hey, when I do the workshops, students come in about twenty to fifteen students. Uh, we'll go around and all throughout the day to work with each student individually, check on their progress. And if I would say, this is it, you know, change, maybe look at making this a little bigger, making this a little smaller, and come back around 20 minutes later, and they start in a whole new direction. I'm like, well, no, whoa, 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 that was good before. Stop here, just do these little, you know, tiny changes, and you're done. It's okay to be done. And because you're doing more work on a project doesn't mean that it's going to get better. Sometimes it can get worse. Right. How long did it take you to get to that point? It's an intelligent way of thinking about it. Uh, just being more, just to be more confident about the actual work. Um, some, it, some of it also has to do with timing. If you have other projects you need to get down, <laughs> you can't just like <laughs> you just work on one thing and it, it depends on how much money you're getting paid. You know, it's, sometimes it is hard to stop though when you know you're not quite there yet. Uh, and that's sort of a balance. Right. But I guess, I mean, it's a very interesting for you to know that, hey, when it's done, it's done. Right. Not for a specific client, but just. Yeah. How do we know when it's, when it's done? Yeah, I don't think, you know, like you said, people sometimes tend to get 
if I work on it longer, it's going to get better and whatever. But you've, in your career, have gotten to a point to say, hey, I've, it's done. That's a very yeah, and then and then it's the and then you have to do the production on it and the mechanical and I'm like oh shoot oh my god so it's not done quite right I well, put it's... that off as long as possible <laughs> it's like done, I'm done okay I have to actually build it right but the building um, it is is no longer design you know you're you're shifting well, to a new a new thing meaning the concept is done the execution of the way you want it and of course the production part of it to get it to look the way you want it to is a different aspect than knowing that so, my design is done. So, right. So how, when is the design done? Well, I, I just know. Right. You, but so, I, and I don't, I don't know that I've gotten better at it though. I don't, I can't say that over the years I've gotten better at knowing what I'm done. I, I don't think so. The idea that, you know, you consider yourself uh, somebody who does branding, who does, um, um, book design packaging. I think that allows you to kind of, to make this leap of making these posters look the way they do because you're you're able to identify something, take all this complex information and 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 parse it down to its simplest form. That skill is something that you've been honing for a long time. And you can tell because you look at the posters on some of these and they're so simplistic in a good way where anybody looks at them and goes, I wish I thought of that first. And I think that's, that's one of the things that's, that... That's what I do too with other designers. Like, man, I wish I would have thought of that or done that. And I think that's cool. So, yeah, I think the, the posters sort of function as like a mini brand. Agreed. Looking at them, you know, they, they are similar in their boldness and sometimes their size of typography but they're definitely distinct in each one. You can understand what's going on for that specific thing mm -hmm. on its own. And I think that's hard to do, but I think you're doing it really, really well. Thanks, George. <laughs> <laughs> um, looking at your body of work, do you think you approach every project the same way? Mm. Uh, I think I probably approach every project the same way, which is... Read, uh, read the brief, but not get it too detailed in doing a lot of back-end research about a company or a specific project. You can get enough to get a sense of what they're doing, but I don't want to be influenced of what other things might have said on a site or their or their white papers or something. But but you know, do some initial ideas, sketches, writing, and then go back and read more detail about what the project, what the company does, et cetera. Uh, it's also like just require pretty quiet environment um, to do that. I don't even, I don't really even listen to music anymore. It's, I find it distracting because I can't separate the words from the music and it's a, you know, it, it's too much for my brain to handle. I can have a baseball game on in the background. It's more like, you know, White radio, noise. radio, right? But so I approach, you know, I just kind of go back and forth between sketching, a little bit of research. Um, yeah, I don't know that I've thought of trying a new way of approaching a project before. It's, no, you probably haven't. No, I mean, if it's not, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? Like, yeah, but there, like you said before, there are a lot of things I don't think about doing, and this is I thought it was really hard coming on the to your show because when I do talk about process, I usually have an arsenal of you know 350 slides at my back to really show how to do it. So I find it really interesting uh, that you're having that you have a show about process when. You, can't show any visuals. You must. I, uh, it's, ch it's challenging for me, for sure. Right, because the visuals but help show why and how and what decisions were made. Right, and I think okay. I think sometimes I'm trying to see if we as creatives don't need to rely, let's say, on that visual, but understand the different things we take. And sometimes, like you said, we don't really 
do. We, we kind of just know that we go on autopilot. We just start to work on something. But when I sit down and ask creatives, what do they do? People do get stumped. Nobody, right. nobody is there with this crafted idea <laughs> because I think they're just, they're, they're, they don't really think about it. Well, I think it's sort of like talking about music without listening to the actual piece of music. You know, I'm like, you know, unless you know that part of the song and that it, you know, it sounds like this, it's difficult to explain a process unless you also see or hear what the result is or the, the workings of that piece. What I think is interesting, though, is that... I'm not dissing your podcast. I'm just saying... No, it's, 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 <laughs> it's just like, wow, this is a... George is doing this. Oh, my gosh. How is he going to do that? So, And I have listened to the two or the three so far. Yay. No, but what, what no, I mean is... That, no, is I think that that for other people listening to this and you're having trouble, I guess, internally understanding what you normally do... I think other people can be like, oh, wow, everybody doesn't always have it always buttoned up, right? They don't, yeah. it, it, you know, like you said, you, you, have a, you have a slideshow of 350 slides helping support your idea, yeah. right? So when they think about it and they go, I just do, and I come up with something and other people do the same thing. I want people to align with these creatives who mm-hmm. say that, oh, you know what? I don't think about it either. Or, you know what, if I did, I actually do need these 350 slides to help support my idea. And the, the fact that there is no one way that we're all coming up to an idea. So I'm, it, I don't want you to be perfect in your answer. I want, you to, I want you to say that, oh shit, you know what, I never really thought about it. <laughs> yeah. And, I mean, and, this is much harder to do than getting up in front of 100 and some people and talking about the work. Right, because like, you don't have that support. Right. So, yeah. you know, I'm trying to see if people have that similarity with other with other designers or other creatives or other, you know, anything that we're all kind of in that same boat of, hey, sometimes I do this and as a listener can be, wow, I do the same thing. So it's good that I can hear that somebody else is doing it. And I feel like I'm part of this creative community or they don't have any idea. Neither do I. <laughs> I'm just going through yeah. the motions. And I think it's good to, to, to have both things. You'll have some people that you hear are really buttoned up and they understand what they do because it's their job to almost explain their process, right? Mm-hmm. Our job as designers is to, is to just do it behind the scenes and get to a solution. You just put yeah. some pieces together and you go, oh, that looks good. <laughs> now, you know, over the years I have, especially you know, recently, um, I have clients who do are, are attracted to a, that, the, the way that my work looks, you know, and that's okay, um, which allows me to keep doing what I do and feel good about what I do. Sounds kind of cheesy. No, I love it. So I think what we're realizing is that not every designer, or creative artist, whatever we consider ourselves, sometimes understands the ways that we actually work. And I think it's gratifying to hear that for somebody who's had a lot of work in design annuals and has gotten a lot of awards is still going through that, that motion of, you know what, I just kind of work this way and I get it done and it's things that I enjoy to do. Yeah. I mean, after what, 25, almost 25 years, I still really love what I do almost every day. Right. I think it's satisfying for me too, to hear that, you know what? I just kind of go through this. I research enough, but it's really relying on my own history, my own research, Mm -hmm. the aesthetics that I tend to gravitate towards. Because I think that's why people gravitate towards your style anyways, because it is classic and it's going to uphold. And it's not, nobody's going to see this and go, oh, that was so 2015, Michael. I'm sorry. (laughs) They're not. (laughs) They're going to look at this and be like, I can put this poster in my house and be timeless. There's a, a point to that, that I've heard people say, not necessarily about my work, or maybe they have just behind my back, but like, oh, wow, it's so simple. My, you see stuff online sometimes. Oh, my five-year-old could have done that, right? It's so simple. Well, sure, I'm sure your five-year-old could draw this or draw this poster, but they did not have to sell it to the client. They did not have to present two or three different versions of it to get to that one. This is so much more than just coming up with a good idea, you know. It's, it's you can come up with a great idea, but it's a lot of work to finish the idea 
and sell the idea and then promote the idea. Agreed. Because I think that's the aspect that a lot of people don't understand. Right. So being growing up in a household, right, with a musician and a designer, you've already been exposed to a lot of the stuff early on. But knowing that you've had 25 years in the industry and everything you've been through and all the different places you've lived in, if you were going to give a younger Michael some advice on the industry and what to do and what not to do, what kind of advice would that be? Well, I would say that uh, the best advice would be to make as many connections as you can. Um, like I said before, you know, designers, current designers, um, no matter if you want to, you know, move or live in that city or not, just make as many contacts as you can and then ask those people who you should talk to, who you should meet or email, uh, because you never know 15 years down the line, that person might have moved their job, opened a new studio, you know, to, to keep all of your options open and to try not to close any doors or burn any bridges. And, and yeah, I've burned some bridges, uh, not, a, not a lot over the 25 years, <laughs> I don't know if put that in there or not, but yeah, it does happen, but go to, you know, as a young designer, I'd say definitely go to as many, um, events as possible, whether they're specific to design, art, music, um, conferences that you can go to, uh, be a pest, follow up, email people. If they don't write back, write them back again, call them, just do whatever you, you can't. I mean, what's the worst they can say? Stop calling me. I mean, like, okay, at least I got an answer finally. That's true. <laughs> right. I mean, what are they going to say? No. All right. Well, yeah. Unfriend you maybe. I don't know. I guess that's a new thing, right? Um, it's tough, but you know, be fearless. Just, just go up to people. If, if, you know, it's one of your design heroes or something and you're at a conference, just go up. Yeah, Again, that's hard, what's the worst that's thing? To do. What's, I know it's sort of it, 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 in the age of the rock star designer, right? Which I find fascinating. It's again a different podcast, right? Maybe you should do something on that. <laughs> no, I just it, as a as a I don't know if it's a movement, but a trend like the rock star designer is really a thing. I think you know. Oh you, yeah, people it's have the, cir- the same thing. Circuit the same designer, people. circuit. You know, everybody's right, doing right. the, the that, conference that wasn't circuit. The case back, you know, we were in school, but it was just starting. I think. That's a whole new. That's a whole other podcast. That's the one you can start. No, this is my this is my first and last podcast. Well, then I'm honored. <laughs> so on that well, note, what does the future hold for Braley Designs? I think I just want to I want to continue to refine what I what I do now. I want to get even better. Short and sweet. So Michael, thank you so much. I know this was like pulling teeth. This was not easy for you. Uh, Um, But I honestly am not trying to fit any of my creative people that I know into any mold. I'm trying to allow them to just explain what they do. And I think that hearing some of the hesitation and hearing some of the ways that you approach your work is really interesting and is going to give some insight to a lot of other people who feel somewhat that they don't always have to fit into this byproduct. They just kind of do. We lose that fact sometimes. We're so used to feeling that, oh, well, making is not always just good. I need to be doing something else. And sometimes, you know what? We're designers. We make. And that's all we need to be doing. You don't have to be, you know, people who do 17 other things. (laughs) Sometimes we we, we just be good at what we're skilled at. Right. All of and as long as you're things. happy with that, that's that's what else do you need? I, I totally agree. I mean, you've given us so many great names for people to look up, to research from design history to current people today, to the people that you've worked with, that I'll have all of these in the show notes so that people can continue to see that, you know, what good design is, what type of people are doing those type of work and who to aspire to, to, to want to be like. Because I think that's one of the things you said, like, I want to be like those people that I admire. Right. And I think that's a a lot of people can gain a lot of insight from just doing something very similar. Once again, thank you um, for being on the podcast. Thank you, George. This is Works in Process. Thanks for listening. Go to the podcast website, wip.show 
where you can find the show notes from this episode and find links to any artists, resources, and work that's mentioned in the interview. Also, if you haven't done so, please subscribe to my Works in Process podcast on Apple Podcasts or any other place you get your podcasts. You also can connect with me on Twitter or Facebook via works underscore in process. That's works with an S underscore in process, one word. And you can find behind the scene pics on Instagram by searching the hashtag works underscore in process. Thanks again. And until next time, follow your gut and trust in the process.